Okay, so looking at the Bretton Woods system and the collapse of the Bretton Woods system has given us a decent understanding of the differences between fixed or pegged and uh, floating exchange rate regimes. But what are the advantages and disadvantages of these regimes? Let's look at those. I mean, generally speaking, the advantages of a floating regime are the actual disadvantages of a fixed regime and vice versa. So what we'll do is actually look at the advantages and disadvantages of a floating regime, which will serve the purpose of providing us with the disadvantages and advantages of a fixed regime. So first of all, the main advantage of a floating exchange rate in theory is supposed to be an automatic balance of payments adjustment. So demand and supply through market forces, in theory, should always clear at a market equilibrium price. And through exports and imports, equilibrium is supposed to be achieved. So for exporters, for example, when an exchange rate is high, or goes too high against all other currencies, exports become relatively more expensive to the same goods produced by other nations. And automatically, consumers, so left to the market mechanism, automatically consumers will get to a point and start reducing their demand for the exports of that particular country because they can get the same goods at a lower price from somewhere else. The currency has gone too high and the importers on the other side are essentially buying the currency first in order to pay for the exporting country's goods. So when the currency goes too high, a country's exports become more expensive. Now let's think of this from the importer's perspective. When an exchange rate is high against all other currencies, imports become cheaper. Cheaper than the same goods produced domestically and demand for those goods increases. So the exchange rate is supposed to automatically adjust. In this instance, automatically adjust lower. And the domestic currency has to be sold in order to buy the foreign currency to purchase the goods for import. So when you have a high currency value, this makes the same goods that you produce domestically at home, the same goods abroad, they become cheaper. So the exchange rate through exports and imports and through the market mechanism the exchange rate is supposed to self-adjust. Now, this example with the importers, a good example is uh, raw material imports, for example, as inputs for domestically produced goods. So what happens when, for example, a manufacturer that requires an input from abroad uh, the manufacturer experiences a increase in the exchange rate. The inputs that they require as raw materials to their produced good domestically become cheaper and they get from their product higher margins and lower prices. So they get lower input prices, therefore they get a higher margin on their product if they sell it for the same price domestically. And we need to start thinking about the basics of currencies here um, to underpin this foundation. In order to buy any currency, another currency must be sold first. It happens automatically. And this dynamic theory, it means that a country's balance of payments should always be self-adjusting to some sort of natural equilibrium determined by market forces.
So to really understand this, what we need to do is dig a little deeper into how a country's balance of payments works. And really, it works as a simple debit or credit, debit and credit system. And this is how a country's balance of payments is made up. And we call it a balance of payments because, given what we just looked at, the payments are actually supposed to balance. And we're going to actually look at this uh, in our systematic process in a lot more detail. But this is how the balance of payments of a modern economy is made up. We basically have a few components that are important. We have the current account of balance, the CAB, and the CAB is exports minus imports, and that's for all goods and services, plus the net income from abroad, plus net current transfers. So the balance of payments, one of the main components is the CAB, and the current, the current account balance, the CAB, is made up through net exports or imports, net income from abroad, and net current transfers. The balance of payments is also made up of the capital account, the financial account, and the balancing item. And it's the sum of all these parts. So the balance of payments is the sum of the current account balance, the capital account, the financial account, and the balancing item. Now let's not worry too much about these other items for the moment. So let's not worry too much about the capital account, the financial account, and the balancing item. Let's focus for the moment on the current account balance and the specific component of the current account balance, which is the exports minus imports, X minus I component, so net exports or imports. As I said, we're going to look at this in a lot more detail when we get to our systematic process, which is much further in the video series. And we need to look at goods and services in total. So goods, I mean, we should know what they are. This is all just common sense, really. Uh, goods are just movable and physical in nature. And for in order for a good to be a transaction, so recorded under goods, a change of ownership from or to a resident of the local country to a resident of a foreign country has to take place. And movable goods include general merchandise, processing, so goods used for processing, and non-monetary gold. An export is basically marked as a credit, so that's when money comes in. So the money comes into the country and the goods go out. And an import is noted as a debit. So money is going out. Money's going out to pay for the import. So exports are marked as a credit and imports are marked as a debit. The balance of payments follows a debit and credit system, as we discussed. It follows the flow of money. It doesn't follow the flow of the good. So it's the reverse of what you think. So you have to get used to this way of thinking. Get used to the way of thinking of following where the money goes. Uh, services, these are basically intangible uh, intangible items, so things like transportation, business services, tourism, royalties, licensing, these are examples of services. You know, another service might be if you're an accountant or lawyer and someone pays for your services from overseas. Um, if money's being paid for a service, so if it's being imported from outside, it's recorded as an import, so a debit in the same way as a good that's being imported is noted as a debit. And if money is received, it is recorded as an export in exactly the same way as goods are. And if debits outweigh credits, so imports outweigh exports, 
there's going to be a deficit of payments and vice versa. If credits outweigh debits, there will be a current account balance surplus. So we treat goods and services in the same way because really, regardless of whether it's a good or a service, it's just a debit or a credit in the current account balance. So one of the ways of really understanding this is to look a little deeper into how this works. Um, for example, if the value of imported items to country X equaled $750 billion last year, but the value of exported items from country X to the rest of the world equaled $1 trillion, then the country X would have a positive $250 billion balance of payments or a $250 billion trade surplus. And a trade surplus is indicative of an economy that's basically called or termed a net creditor to the rest of the world. It basically shows how much a country is saving as opposed to consuming or investing. What this means is that the country is providing goods, services, resources to other economies and is owed money in return for those goods, services or resources. And by providing these resources abroad, a country with a trade surplus gives other economies the chance to increase their productivity whilst they are running a current account balance deficit. And that's what's referred to in economics, in macroeconomics, as a country financing a deficit of another country. And the way you should think of this is try to think of it in invoicing terms. So if you uh, run a company yourself, you, know, you, you issue invoices and you receive money for those invoices and you send goods or services uh, when the money is received. If you start to think of things overall in invoicing terms, this makes things a lot easier. We're basically, as a country running a trade surplus, sending invoices to countries that are running deficits and sending resources in return for money. So start thinking of this in invoicing or loaning terms. Um, in the modern world, in modern macroeconomics, Japan uh, remains the largest net creditor nation in the world, and China comes a close second. Now let's think of it the other way around. If the value of imported items to country X equaled a trillion, but exported items from country X equaled 750 billion, then the country X would have a negative 250 billion balance of payments or 250 billion trade deficit. Now this basically reflects an economy that is a net debtor to the rest of the world. It's consuming or investing more than it's saving and the economy is using resources from other economies to meet its domestic consumption and investment requirements. A trade deficit is <clears throat> less favorable than a trade surplus, of course, but it might not be a bad thing. An economy, for example, might decide that it needs to invest for the future or to receive more investment income in the long term. So the, the NI and NCT components may actually offset the exports and imports deficit, creating a positive current account balance or a current account balance deficit might be offset by a positive capital account and financial account. So the current account balance deficit or surplus that can be created by exports minus imports can actually be offset by long-term investment. And that can be from the NI and the NCT components. And it can create an overall current account balance. So it's not necessarily a 
bad thing, but it's obviously less favorable than a trade surplus. And in the modern world, the US remains the largest net debtor nation at minus 18 trillion deficit, with the UK a close second. So basically, a deficit shows the total public and private debt owed to non-residents. And that's repayable in internationally accepted currencies, goods, services, where the public debt is the money or credit owed by any level of government and private debt or money or credit owed by private households or private corporations based in the country under consideration. I know this is, uh, it gets a little bit complicated, but it's really critical to knowing all this stuff. So I would advise you to go through the vi this video a few times. Um, a surplus shows the total public and private debt owed to the country by non-residents, and that's repayable in domestic currency for goods or services, where the public debt is the money or credit owed by any level of government and private debt or money or credit owed by private households or private corporations based in overseas countries. Basically, what that's saying is, is that if you run a deficit, uh, you owe money to other countries in international currencies. And if you run a surplus, you are owed money in your domestic currency. And in theory, the main advantage of a floating rate is that when these things get out of whack, a country's exports minus imports and keeping all things equal. So if we fix everything else, it's supposed to self-adjust. Supposed to self-adjust due to market forces and a country's current account balance and balance of payments should automatically self-adjust to a natural equilibrium and optimal resource allocation is supposed to be achieved. Countries that produce get rewarded and countries that don't produce get punished. And this is supposed to be one of the main advantages of a floating exchange rate system. Therefore, it by default is supposed to be a disadvantage of a fixed exchange rate regime. So the, in a fixed exchange rate regime, a country is not allowed to tend towards the natural equilibrium or the market clearing rate. And typically what you may see is that large unwanted deficits can occur under fixed exchange rate systems. And that was one of the facets of the Bretton Woods system. So the United States had a fixed US dollar peg to gold. And over a number of years, they managed to create a large and unwanted deficit.